Hello everybody and welcome to the Winecast. I've been wanting to do a cast on Australian wine for a while and I've also received quite a few requests for such a cast. And in a lot of ways this cast is overdue since Australia is a major wine producer and important player in the wine world. But in addition to those things, Australia is something else as well. It's large. Very large actually. In fact, if you compare it to the 48 contiguous United States, it clocks in at only a little smaller in terms of total area. So it makes about as much sense to try to talk about all Australian wine in a single cast as it would to talk about all American wine or all French, Italian, and Spanish wine, for that matter, in a single cast. Therefore, the goal for this cast will just be to introduce you to Australia's role in the world wine economy, give you a little bit of a lay of the land in terms of where the major production areas are, and then talk some about wine law grapes and styles, all in anticipation of future casts on each of the major wine regions in the country, like I've been doing for France and, more recently, Spain and Italy. Wine grapes, or Vitis vinifera, first made it to Australia when cuttings from the Cape Colony in what would later become South Africa arrived in New South Wales on the eastern coast of the continent in 1788. Since there are no grape species that are native to Australia, the incoming vines didn't have to face any natural predators like vines arriving on the east coast of North America did, and it was possible to start making wine in Australia from the get-go, with the only obstacles to quality production being good cuttings and viticultural and winemaking know-how. The first steps at overcoming these obstacles were taken in 1833 when James Busby, a British subject who can rightfully be thought of as the father of Australian wine, and who had come to Australia earlier to teach viticulture, returned from a trip to France and Spain with cuttings from a large number of varietals from each of these countries, as well as information on more effective wine growing and wine making techniques that he had acquired during his travels. Wine knowledge and technique also got a boost a few decades later as immigrants from various wine-producing regions in Europe made their way to Australia, and quality wines were consistently being produced down under by the mid-1800s. Later in the century, though, disaster struck with the arrival of phylloxera in the 1870s. Phylloxera first landed in Victoria and then spread to New South Wales, doing considerable harm to the local industry. Like most countries affected by this pest, Australia recovered, but also like most affected countries, the recovery came by emphasizing quantity production over quality production, and for most of the 20th century, Australia was known more for bulk wine and fortified sweet wine than it was for quality dry wine production, though there were some notable exceptions to this trend, like the remarkable Penfolds Grange, for example. Starting in the 1980s, though, Australia entered what can only be called a wine boom, with huge increases in the amount of land under vine throughout the country and corresponding increases in production and, most importantly, exports, making Australia into a true global wine powerhouse. Despite some setbacks to the wine economy, during the new millennium, Australia remains a powerful player on the world wine stage. In 2016, it was the world's fifth largest producer of wine and the fifth largest exporter of wine that year as well, with exports equivalent to 1.7 billion US dollars. 2016 was also significant because it saw China become the premier destination for Australian wine exports for the first time, replacing the US and the UK that had vied for that spot in previous decades. China's new place as the top destination for Australian imports is consistent with Australia's role as a provider of wine for other countries in its corner of the world, and it's a major exporter to countries in Southeast Asia and India, and has been playing a more and more important, though still modest, role in supplying wine to South Korea. Though it's a big exporter, Australia hasn't been a big importer of wine, and in 2016 it ranked as only the 15th largest importer of wine in the world, with Aussies preferring to drink domestic, and only around 17% of wine sold in Australia is imported wine. For comparison's sake, that number in the U.S. is closer to 30%. So where is all this wine coming from? Well, though there's wine produced in all six of Australia's states and the Northern Territory, the big players are the states of New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia. There are somewhat smaller but still very important production areas in Western Australia, and the island state of Tasmania, though not as well known for individual wine regions, has been coming into its own as a producer in recent years. So that's where most of the wine is coming from, but how is the system regulated? In Australia, wine production is regulated through geographical indications, or GIs. 
But I'm using regulated very loosely here because the Australian system is a lot like the systems used in Germany or in the United States and most other New World wine producers that are really all about guaranteeing the claims that a producer makes about place of origin, vintage, and kinds of grapes in the bottle, instead of mandating specific practices in the vineyard or the winery. Currently, there are over 100 GIs in Australia that range in size from the entire country to much smaller regions and subregions. The country, multi-state, state, and zonal, or in the case of several combined zones, superzonal GIs are based on boundaries of national, civic, and other political units and weren't thought up with homogeneity of terroir in mind. So it's the smaller regional and sub-regional designations that were drawn up based on similarities of geography and climate that are the most prestigious. The system is administered by Wine Australia that until recently was known as the Australian Wine and Brandy Corporation, a government-funded company based in Adelaide that, among other things, defines the various GIs in the system. Though the geographic indication system doesn't regulate much in the way of viticulture or winemaking practice, it does have standards for labeling of grape origin, varietal labeling, and vintage dating, and in all of these cases the system follows the so-called 85% rule. So, if the label lists a single GI, then at least 85% of the grapes that the wine was made from will have come from that GI. If less than 85% of the grapes are from a single GI, the producer has the option of designating the wine with a larger GI up the scale that does account for at least 85% of the grapes, or he can list all of the GIs from which the grapes were sourced separately on the label. If a wine is designated as a single varietal, then similarly, 85% of the grapes from which it's made must be that varietal. If no grape reaches the 85% threshold, then the label can either not show a varietal at all, or must list each varietal used in descending order of its presence in the wine. And finally, if the wine has a vintage designation, then a minimum of 85% of the grapes used to make the wine must have been grown in the named year. And what are these grapes? Australia grows lots and lots of different grapes with at least 150 different varietals of Vitis vinifera available to winemakers. The top seven, based on numbers available for 2010, are Shiraz, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, that you may hear pronounced Semillon by some Australians, and Pinot Noir. Following closely on their heels is Riesling, a very important player in Australian wine, and though somewhat smaller in terms of their plantings, Grenache and Mourved have a long history in Australia of being paired with Shiraz to create GSM, or Grenache, Shiraz, and Mourved blends. In terms of style, Australia has a great reputation for varietal wines, but blends, especially those featuring members of the top seven grapes, are well known too, with Shiraz and Cab Sauv blends being especially popular. Sweet, fortified wines that Australians refer to as stickies and that usually feature Grenache if red or Muscat if white were a big part of Aussie production during the 20th century and still have a loyal fan base. And sparkling wines, especially sparkling whites from the southernmost parts of the country, have been making a splash recently, but if you really want to try a different sort of bubble, be on the lookout for red sparkling Shiraz, a perennial favorite down under. We've covered a lot of ground in this cast, but I don't want to end it without pointing you to at least a handful of key regions and the wines they're famous for. The Hunter Valley in New South Wales has a curious climate that's very warm and humid by day, but cooled by breezes in the evening thanks to its proximity to the sea. This is white country producing creamy, luscious Chardonnay and spectacular Semillon that just seems to keep getting better with age. By contrast, the mudgy area just west of the Hunter Valley is known for its reds, particularly its Cabernet Sauvignon. Rutherglen in Victoria is famous for big, brassy Shiraz, and the Mornington Peninsula and Yarra Valley, some of the most southerly of the Appalachians on the main body of Australia, take advantage of the cooler climate down south to grow well-regarded Shards and Pinot Noir. And where there's Shard and Pinot, of course, there will be bubbles. In South Australia, Barossa and the McLaren Vale have a remarkable reputation for Shiraz, while Coonawarra gets praise for its intensely concentrated Cabernet Sauvignon and the Clare and Eden Valleys keep whites on the map with their Rieslings. Western Australia's Margaret River produces both reds and whites, but it's especially highly regarded for Chardonnay and for Bordeaux-styled blends of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. Finally, Tasmania, the farthest south and coolest of Australia's states, took a page from the Yarra and Mornington playbook and has been producing hard-to-find but much sought-after Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, both still and sparkling. 
Finally, though I doubt this makes any difference in terms of quality, if it's important to you to seek out vines planted on their own rootstock, it's worth noting that Tasmania, South Australia, and Western Australia, as well as the minor wine producing area in the Northern Territory, are phylloxera free and kept that way by a strict quarantine system. Queensland is also free of the pest, though some of its vineyards are in an at-risk zone for the bug. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. There's much, much more to say about Australian wine, particularly about the wines produced in the various regions, but also about what Australia's wine boom can teach us about the economics and culture of wine. But that will have to wait for future casts. For now, I hope this cast oriented you better toward Aussie wines and left you feeling more comfortable about checking them out or getting to know them better. If it has or was otherwise helpful and interesting, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and always feel free to leave a comment, question, or request. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.